Oh. <laughs> Oota, aga ma jää see istuma. Ma jää see istuma. Kas siit on kuulda? Okei. Okay. All right, all right. Hello everyone on Zoom. Um, so people are here slowly gathering and uh, we're about to have our second speaker coming up who is going to be Artur Shabak. And uh, we're still continuing on DeFi and yield farming. So we're having uh, some technical difficulties, uh, but everything should be good already by now. So uh, get into seats and uh, stay tuned for our tour. I believe it's very interesting what he has to say. So All right. Stay tuned. Well, it became something interesting, right? Um, you hear me? No. no? I see. Okay. Hey, what's up? Who sold their uni tokens or who got their uni tokens today? <laughs> nice. That's where the gas fees went up. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, DeFi in general and then the current state and yield farming strategies and my story of yield farming. So a previous talk was really good. It was more like a visionary talk, uh, what's possible with the DeFi in the long term. Really awesome presentation. And uh, I was worried in the beginning it's going to be some, a lot of overlap, but we don't have overlap. And even if it was overlap, since it's going to be online, I would have to repeat everything anyways. So... Um, Shout out to Crystal Low. Um, why? Because he actually, I, I actually took his uh, slides and incorporated it into my presentation. So he did the half of the work for him. So I have to shout out to him. Thank you, Kristin, for that. If you listen to me. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so next hour, a little bit less, we're going to talk about DeFi, its state, um, like what are the strategies you can do in DeFi, like what do you need to do, why you need to do, why it's needed, some stories, um, something that is happening now in real life and how DeFi can be applied, what are the risks, how you mitigate, control them, and then you will make your own decision, right, and you'll have fun. So, next slide. A little, bit, a little bit more about me. Um, I used to be Bitcoin maximalist until recently because I was making fun of blockchain, like, oh, like you can't use blockchain like everywhere and Bitcoin is the, is the thing, right? But now I actually start to understand more about smart contracts and this whole DeFi, which is just a DAO or just a bunch of smart contracts interacting with each other. So I see a potential in that. There are a lot of challenges. Um, still needs to be solved, like like pegging um, real life assets to synthetic assets on blockchain. But yeah, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, yeah, so um, started trading Bitcoin seven years ago, and till now um, went through multiple bull runs, like four of them at least. Um, started a startup now, which is Paxful. Maybe some of you know. Who knows what is Paxful? Yeah, like seventy percent, not enough. Okay, so I have to tell to the rest of 30%. So Paxful is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace uh, for money transfers with anyone, anywhere, um, anytime in the world. So what it means that anybody can buy Bitcoin with any form of, of payment and then anybody else can sell Bitcoin with any form of payment. And thanks to that, um, the, the abilities to move money around the world are limitless. So we connect all the all the payment networks with each other, right? So they, they kind of like DeFi, so they start talking with each other thanks to the peer-to-peer -peer network. So we are number one uh, by our volume, so we went past local Bitcoins and we're doing good. We are growing, um, working with amazing people in our company, but that's not enough. Like, we don't want to be like another local Bitcoins that we become complacent and, and then, uh, you know, somebody will run over us, especially how aggressive the space is now. Uh, that's why we need to build an ecosystem. So, and DeFi is part of that. So, 
I'm going to talk about this. And it's, again, it's aligning with our, with our company mission and vision. We give financial freedom to people with the tech and with that easy to use product. So next slide. Okay, some disclaimers. I'm not an expert what I'm going to talk about. Somebody will know more than me for sure. So I'm welcome to discuss, learn from each other, right? So it's kind of, we can discuss with each other here, um, whatever, somebody knows more stuff, please add. Um, I expect uh, you to understand how Ethereum blockchain works, how MetaMask works, and, you know, Web3 wallet, how transactions work. And that, that's basically it, right? And uh, maybe I have some opinions that um, you may not disagree, like a, a previous uh, presenter doesn't see a big need for the yield farming, but I see. So, yeah, there's going to be things like that. Okay, next slide. All right, so what is DeFi? Um, in short, if, if Bitcoin is about the payments, right, uh, it's uh, um, denationalizing the payments, like anybody has access to payments, but the DeFi is uh, anybody has access to finance in a decentralized way. There is an easy onboarding, there is uh, less friction, and uh, it's just a bunch of smart contracts. It's, uh, anybody can build it. So let me tell you a story, um, what's happening now in Africa in Sierra Leone. Um, I just heard it recently. Um, every morning a fisherman is taking a loan um, with a 10% daily interest. So he takes a loan, he goes, he goes to get his fish, right? During the day, gets his fish, sells it and pays back the loan, right? So why, why he needs the loan is, I don't know, he needs, uh, he needs to buy supplies, uh, he needs to rent a boat, um, gas, gasoline. Uh, that's pretty nuts, 10% interest rate. And then he has his ways like, he needs to stand in the line, in the bank. Uh, okay, he can optimize it by sending his uh, relatives to stand there early on and, and, and so on. But, and that's the habit there. And it's, it's crazy that actually the tech is there to, to, for them to get a cheaper loan and, and, the, and just to start using the, the tech. But the problem is that the tech is complicated and that's one thing. And then the second thing is the products are complicated. Okay, we're working on the easy to use products. But then there's a third thing is the habit, habit of the people. You can't really change the habit overnight. Same with the Bitcoin. Um, people did not start to use Bitcoin like overnight. They, it took some time and, you know, they had to some, if, if they get, if they get cut out of financial system, they have to use it, right? They get uh, creative and they just have to use it. They have no choice like in, Venezuela or um, I know um, exporters importers in Nigeria uh, because they have simply no other alternatives but here the fisherman still has an alternative so that's why it's a, it's about changing the habit um, yeah so first example of uh, DeFi app maybe was in 2013 the first stable coin based on uh, based on uh, bit shares uh, well, right now how die uh, stablecoin works. It's back to Ethereum value and every six hours it checks the Ethereum value on the market through Oracle and then when the value of Ethereum changes it rebalances the DAI supply so one DAI is always one dollar, right? But for example when the Black Thursday happened in March the DAI value spiked. It became like one dollar twenty cents so there's still it's trying to, to balance itself, but um, you know, there's still some work to do for that. So next slide, next slide. I'll get to more, even more interesting stuff. That's for people who don't know about DeFi. Anyway, why so big deal? Basically, in my, in my opinion, it's about the composability that all this um, financial, let's, let's call them financial institutions, they start to, they start talking with each other by default. Right now, the banks, the APIs are not open with each other. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a PSD2 in the Europe, right? But it takes time. So by default, they talk to each other and you can build on top of each other apps, apps, call smart contracts, one, another one. So it's, it's pretty cool and amazing once you get this concept. Um, and so the money is 
more and more money is getting locked, right? Historically, uh, there was no trust because of the DAO accident. And then when this ecosystem started to evolve, like uh, insurance and uh, all this stuff, so the confidence came back. So we have like, what, $8 billion locked already in DeFi? And there's even more uh, Bitcoin locked than in Lightning Network. Again, it's my opinion for, um, for the money that people want to make, right? Because in Bitcoin, it's about the payments. There's no this incentive structure is like in yield farming. Anyway, next slide. All right, so what do we have now? Stable coins, like just said. Um, the first one was BitShares, now it's DAI, now it's USDT, now it's USDC. Decentralized exchanges, I'm going to talk about them more. Um, the borrowing and lending, I'm going to talk about this too. Um, the Compound, MakerDAO, Aave. Synthetic assets, I'm not going to talk about this. Basically, in short, you can buy Tesla stock without KYC onboarding. You don't have to register on a, on a, a Meritrade or I don't know, wherever. Just go and buy it on the Synthetics website and the, the, the asset, the synthetic asset just follows the Tesla price. So then there's insurance against, against the smart contract risk uh, and the yield farming. I'm going to talk about that too. Because who wants to make some money here? That's why we're going to talk about <laughs> yield farming. Next slide. All right, so we have uh, this, this centralized exchanges. One is uh, um, like a traditional exchange with an order book, uh, but in a decentralized way, they have their own ways how to keep the order books, uh, I don't know, through like some like master nodes or whatever more things. Then there's this new cool innovation is the liquidity pools, um, AMM, automated market makers, as like Uniswap balancer curve um, here on the left. Uh, everybody can now be a market maker and then uh, you can exchange your assets, right, with each other, the ERC20 tokens. And then as you see, there's a wrap BTC. I'm going to talk about this, how this happens. And then there's a, your fee and uh, how much you're getting. That's pretty cool. Then there's uh, aggregators like one inch. So that's what we have now in uh, DeFi about decentralized exchanges. Again, it's evolving at massive speed. One month ago, it was a different story. There was no... Um, the, there were no other things like right now, Mooney swap or um, sushi swap, right? So it's or this is massive. Swap. Noodle swap. <laughs> Pickle. Yeah, it's, it's actually going to be soon. So next slide. Yeah, so that's that's how people are wrapping their assets into Ethereum blockchain. So um, it can be in the DeFi ecosystem and again. In short, uh, you deposit your BTC to, to REN to project, to wrap BTC. It waits uh, six confirmations, so that project becomes a custodial of the actual BTC, and they mint you the token that represents one-to-one -one value. And you can have some fun in, in the DeFi world with that. Okay, next slide. All right, so the liquidity pools that I just said is the Uniswap. Everybody can be a market maker. You make fees from that. When somebody trades, uh, depends what your liquidity. Uh, out of all the liquidity, you're making fees according to that. So, um, and it's important that anybody who builds something new in the DeFi space, they need to incentivize people to provide the initial liquidity, right? And then we see all these games like, you know, this vampire exchanges like SushiSwap is trying to lure over uh, the liquidity from Uniswap by giving out free tokens. So, and in my opinion, basically the liquidity providers in the DeFi space are not so loyal customers like customers are loyal on uh, centralized exchanges because it's just like one transaction to go from one liquidity pool to another liquidity pool just to make more money. So, and then as you see below, Balancer, Synthetics, uh, Ren, Uma, Compound, CRV, Sushi, Kimchi, Pickle, all these uh, vegetables um, are given by, as a governance tokens, by this uh, liquidity pools and decentralized exchanges. Um, let's go next slide. So, few concepts of uh, AMMs. There's an impermanent loss. Um, I'm not going to try to explain you what it is. Uh, 
I still, I mean, it took me a while, so just see the example here. If you, if you just huddle one asset, it goes up in price a lot faster than if you put a pair of this one asset and another asset, and it does not, so because the other asset does not go so much up in price, it tries to balance itself 50-50 on Uniswap. Um, you get less gains. So always think about this impermanent loss. It happens when you put two assets in the liquidity pool which don't have one-to-one -one ratio. So if you put like USDC, USDT, or um, a, a wrap BTC, rent BTC, there's no loss of, I mean, there's no risk of impermanent loss. So do not get wrecked. That's the moral of the story. Personally, I think uh, I got wrecked with Ampleforth, but then there was one pump and then I sold it uh, at a really good time. It went to $2 and before it rebased, I sold it. So happy end. Next slide. All right, so lending borrowing. Um, showing here what my friend is doing, uh, Stani from Ave. It's a pretty cool thing. Uh, that's actually the first concept to yield farming. I'm going to explain that later on. Uh, what, what are the steps and what are you gaining? So you loan some, some collateral like Ethereum and then you can borrow something else. And the magic here is that you have to give out more than you can lend. So in real world, if you want to borrow from bank, uh, you can give less collateral than you're borrowing, right? So you, you, you give collateral your, your property and then you can borrow more than the property costs, let's say so. But here you have to deposit, let's say, $1,500 worth of Ethereum and you can borrow only $1,000 worth of USDC of a stable coin. Because if the Ethereum drops in price less than $1,000, uh, you don't have enough collateral to pay back USDC. So what happens? Liquidation. Your Ethereum gets liquidated and all this uh, decentralized the market make, um, money makers, they have their liquidation strategy that you can lose like 50% of your Ethereum, 10, 20, whatever, whatever the logic is. So you can see here um, how much my collateral ratio, I can borrow actually 30 more percent to max out my borrowing. I almost got wrecked. I had this at 99% when everything started to tank about two weeks ago. So I was super lucky. I had to, it was a race. It was like a James Bond movie for me. I had to take out from my liquidity from Mooniswap, that's one transaction, on stake, second transaction, and then I had to always make the fast fees until I could pay back some of the true USD, so my collateral ratio went back to this normal percentage. Ethereum, I think it went from 450 to 350. So, yeah. And me as a lender, I'm making like, what? Oh, you don't see here, under deposits, I'm making like one, two percent on my Ethereum a, a year just by lending it and there's only a smart contract risk. That's it. It's, I was a little bit skeptical before but now I went all in because YOLO, that's, that's the DeFi space right now. Uh, next slide. All right, let's get to yield farming. That's something, something I saw first time. I was like, what the hell is this? I'll give some time to read. It makes perfect sense for me. Oh, so who, who understands what's there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, okay, that's good. So, okay, for everybody else, let's make a crash course. Um, for me, two months ago, and even before how my DeFi journey started, I, I was on a radio interview in spring that I talked about you know, peer to peer finance, financial freedom, about Bitcoin, about Paxful, like how it's helping people around the world. And then at the end, the guy was like, oh, what do you think about DeFi? Like, what's DeFi? He's like, oh, we, we actually had before you last week, some guy from one inch talking about DeFi. That's the, that's, the, that's the shit, right? Like, okay. And then I started to read about it, but I still didn't get it. And then I set a goal like, okay, I have this Ethereum that I'm just sitting it on for two or three years, not making anything. And, this, and then I read all these gains, 150%. Like, let me experiment. I'll uh, start playing with that Ethereum and then in two months I'll see 
how much x-ray theorem I'll gain because it's not trading, right? In trading, you can lose when you trade. But here, you give your liquidity, there's no risk of losing in trading. There is a risk of impermanent loss, smart contract risk, basically different risks. So, and that's what I recommend. If you want to start getting into that, have some goals. Because I was just reading, reading, I didn't understand for two weeks. I, I, I met some friends who I know in blockchain. I was like, hey, where's all this money coming from? Where's the 150% coming from? 250, like, what the hell? So then I understood, okay, these are the this governance tokens that are being, you have a question? It will be soon, yes. First, let's get to the sweet part, then the risks. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was reading about that, then I like, met a couple of friends like, who are into blockchain, and some of them are here, and then yeah, we're all together like, okay, this is uh, just these tokens that have value, and then they get uh, listed on centralized exchanges like Binance, and then all this retail is buying up then, is trading, right? While like, we are just farming them by giving our liquidity, right? We're helping the project, like really sincere intentions. Um, so, yeah, then when I got into and when I started to finally understand, I was like up till 6, 7 a.m. and having spreadsheets like about my movements and all that, so really trying to keep it organized. And yes, two months I, I made 15, 20% profit, so no trading, um, quite risk free, and I, I still have all these uh, shit tokens that I haven't sold them. Like, I'm big with Meta, um, I'm stable. Unfortunately, it went down from 10 to like two, two dollars, whatever. Um, I, I got, I did break even and the goal is to learn it so we can implement that in Paxful eventually. So some good stuff is cooking there behind the scenes. Uh, next slide. All right, so let's talk about what we need to do. Recipes. First thing, what I did, I deposited Ethereum to Compound as a collateral. I borrow 75% of the Ethereum value of USDC. And now I'm, I'm making compound token. It's like $160 now on, on exchanges. Because I give them my uh, liquidity to compound project. Now I'm going to mStable. I'm minting them USD. It's a one-to-one -one ratio to USDC. I'm putting the same USD into the balancer uh, uh, exchange. This, so I'm earning now balancer tokens, I'm earning MTA and the trading fees from the balancer because there are people also putting here the liquidity, right? And there's kind of this uh, chain reaction. There's this, in, in balancer, it's not always 50-50% ratio. You can set your own ratio, you can set your own trading fees when you create this, this pool of two assets. I think this is like 5%, and USD, this is 95%. And then imagine this. You, you, you mint this MUSD, but you don't have MTA. So in Balancer, you can deposit MUSD, MTA gets bought automatically. So, and then it goes up in price. And then the return percentage increases. And then people see that. Next person starts to, to deposit here because the higher percent, the percentages, automatically this gets bought. That's how it goes up, like a snowball, but the reverse. <laughs> that's, that's crazy, yeah. It still blows my mind. Next thing, that's not all. Wait, there's, wait, there's more. <laughs> now you're staking your, you get this BLT token. Th that's basically your, your de deposit into the balance, your BLT token you can stake into mStable projects so you can earn extra MTA. Why? Um, I'm not sure, but I think it's so. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 so you lock your MTA, so there's no sell pressure on MTA, right? So it gets more scarce. It's like uh, this, the, the centralized uh, startups like uh, crypto.com is also using that approach. Like lock your crypto token for six months, you get your debit card for free, you get your cashbacks, whatever. So there is less sell pressure. That's genius. So, and here's some numbers, right? With 100K investment, 75%, 75K a year, 200 bucks daily, 1500 a week. Risk of impermanent loss. Um, if the MTA price goes down, if it was 1,000, uh, no, if it was $10, you have there, let's say, 1,000 of MTA tokens, and then you have 20 bucks. Now it goes up and down in price. Now you have five, $5, now you have 2,000 of them. 
in that pool and you have twice as less dollars so um, I mean you, you just have to understand like how this works because this is a big big thing yeah any questions about this recipe the fees are crazy I paid like I think when I turned back my MUSD back into USDC I paid 200 bucks one transaction plus five other transactions like another hundred bucks or so 300 bucks the backwards right and then to do this way it was like hundred bucks and then backwards another 300 bucks so 400 bucks in fees that's true that's gambling right I, I'm, I don't do that shit I, I keep out of trading I don't do gambling. So what's the minimum amount of investment you need to do to be break even? Just, just do your math, man, if the fees are like four. <laughs> assume $400 of the fees. So if you go below 10,000, you will not get break even? Yes, five, five uh, digits, yep. Yeah, so that, that's pretty um, nuts, but there's more to that. Uh, that's the full degen zone. Uh, it's one of the next slides. Okay, common recipe, okay, the Bitcoin maximalists who are holding their BTC. I was also like holding BTC for whatever time. I'm like, fuck, let's make some money. <laughs> so you mint SSBTC, I mean, you mint a REN BTC or WBTC, you deposit it to Curve. So Curve is uh, also AMM, but it focuses on uh, pairs which have stable pairs with each other. It focuses BTC to BTC. Um, the token has BTC to BTC to, to, to USD stable coins with each other and then they're going to add gold I think there's some talk about so you deposit into this their SBTC pool uh, your REN BTC it's a pool of uh, three assets REN BTC, RAD BTC, SBTC I don't even know what is SBTC but what the, supposedly they're I mean yeah they're uh, synthetic okay Syn synthetic BTC yeah but look, they, they keep their one-to-one -one ratio, right? Yeah. So because of the power, you gave your liquidity there. You're earning CRV and the trading fees. So trading fees from everybody else who is also depositing there. And I deposit just the rain BTC there, so it buys automatically from the pool, is BTC and wrap BTC. So I paid the fees, somebody who deposited before me got my fees. So now I'm earning the CRV. Now, so in order not to have a sell pressure on CRV, you stake the CRV into their DAO, you get extra CRV. That's awesome. So again, this is not it. I mean, the people behind that are geniuses of all, with all these game mechanics and so on, like how to incentivize people to, to lock into their platform, all, all these things. Like, then you, you have this boost thing. I've never seen this boosting in, in other places. Um, you can get up to 2.5x boost. If you lock up, I think that for four years, you get this 2.5 boost. And then there's more complex, it depends who else is locking up this, this CRV, so you can get up to 2.5x boost and, and this is how much you can make, 45% or even more, you can play around there between their different pools and no risk of impermanent loss because one to one ratio of this uh, um, tokenized BTC. Any questions about this? Don't get wrecked. <laughs> yeah, well. Like, there are different ways I'll tell them, okay. okay. Because it's more or less risk, I mean, it's more risk-free because it's no impermanent loss, right? There's a smart contract risk and, uh, I don't know, Ethereum death risk, uh, gas fees, yeah. You also have the custodial risk of the, the Bitcoin. Exactly, custodial risk, yeah. I think, the, I think there's some news that some hackers are trying to always hack and get the private keys for this address that has a lot of this BTC. Next slide, please. Okay, so easy recipe. Yearn. Who knows about yearn finance? Cool, cool. Uh, I, personally, I'm really bullish on that. Uh, the guy behind this, uh, Andre Krone, is, is genius. He's been in the DeFi for so many years. So he's the brains behind the project. And he's, the idea of the yearn is they, like a hedge fund, right? Like the, the previous uh, presenter was saying, it's a, aggregating is no it's, it's pulling together all people's uh, funds and then the single and then using that as, as a single as a single pool to go into like crv and then you can get uh, 
this 2.5x uh, boost and, and all that because it's pulled together, that's one thing. And the second thing, you save on the gas fees because again, it's pulled together, there's some savings. And then it just goes and, and kills the, its, its copycat, like uh, this D, D finance or IT, two eyes and CRV and Swerve, all, all that. It just fucking goes, goes and farms the, the hell out of them. So I think it's an amazing thing. I don't know how long it's going to last, the whole farming, but as long as the farming lasts, that's one going to be there and uh, second is they're building their their own products like stable credit um, insurance and all that so it's, that's the community too that's why they're moving so fast because uh, um, because it's the community that they're building that in parallel right, right? in the centralized organization it's like more you gotta you gotta like be more organized but here it's just build stuff so that's a cool project in my opinion all the haters, uh, we can talk later about this. Okay, so now some hardcore recipe. This is, uh, um, so our friend, actually, Kristen Lowe, who I mentioned at the beginning, he told about this. So that's how you can uh, do leverage on your collateral, so, I mean, on your lending. So you, you can get, you can lend more than your collateral because you, you do multiple, s multiple iterations of lending, easy. You have the stable coin. I mean, you, you get stable coin on Compound or Avi. You deposit to Curve. You get this YCRV token. You deposit YCRV to Yearn to, to generate YYCRV. So it gets you, it gets you this uh, CRV. Well, the Yearn actually automatically sells the CRV token and is giving you back uh, the stable coin. Now, there's this Queen Finance. I don't know what the hell is this, but I tried it. It's amazing. It's just like a copy of Compound. But then you, you can lend and borrow more this uh, this like YCRV assets. That, 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 so that's this composability and like how easy you can get all this uh, new assets. Like again, without regulations, anything, you just go and create this assets that you can lend and borrow. So point is now this YCRV, you can lend it. Now you have another collateral. Now you can borrow again stable coins. So you're earning cream because Cream is like this compound token, is the governance token of the cream finance. And then you repeat that cycle multiple times, um, up to five, whatever, whatever you feel like. Because look, if you did the two cycles, the $1,200 in gas fees and 250% return. If you do more cycles, you can get even more. I personally haven't done it, but that's another hardcore recipe. I know if it make any, made any sense, but the idea is that you, you can do iterations to lend more than your collateral. All right, um, I'm speechless too, actually, what's, what's possible. Uh, next slide. All right, that's the, the, that's the DGEN zone. Um, so who's that guy on the right bottom? Our From where? Beatmex. Yes, this guy is also complete DGEN, because he's also like researching, and then he wrote this blog post about the DeFi future and so on. But hey, this is what we have. This. Um, screenshot I took from CoinGecko, they have this um, slider to show all these DGEN things. So the idea is that, as you see Pickle Finance, you, the, the pair is a Uniswap, Pickle and Wrapped Ethereum, 3,000% yearly. Like, how is it? 3,000, that's crazy. But um, So, as you see, you need to buy Pickle before you, before you can participate in that. And then this Pickle basically says, if you participate in this pool, Pickle Wrapped Ethereum, compared to Wrapped Ethereum USDC pool, so in Wrapped Ethereum USDC pool, they give you five times less Pickle in return. But in that Pickle, I think in Sushi, they, had, they gave you like 5x more Sushi in return. And that's why you buy Sushi, so you can get this five times x, x more return, and then everybody buys Sushi, and then that, that percentage grows until you know, collapse happens. We've seen that. I know, you, you call this Ponzi or not, uh, there's definitely some characteristics on that. Um, I, I keep personally out of that, out of that because uh, I just don't want to play these games. I'm just doing this stable yield farming of this like long lasting projects. Again, impermanent loss, like sushi value drops, right? That's, that's a big thing. Um, I still keep sushi, but uh, I think now that Uni has their own tokens, it won't, will, will just float there at one dollar. 
So the smart contract bu bug, if you remember, there's what, another game of, uh, of the rebase game. That was like a month ago. So it is like a yam, it's yam that the sweet potato knows what's, who knows yam? Cool. So yeah, they, they have this uh, rebase every eight hours that uh, people pull in the, the pool, they get return of yams, and then the price goes up. And then in eight hours, it um, either creates or destroys so many yams that the price has, has to be again $1, right? So it equalizes to $1. So there's this game until it goes, goes up in value, and then the weak hands are selling that before it, it creates this more yams um, that's gonna tank the price down, like, like 10x. If the price went up to $10, then it's gonna create 10 times more yams. So that's like this, the, the, the DGEN zone where all these games are happening on Ethereum smart contract, on Ethereum blockchain. Yeah, and then this, another risk is the unaudited smart contracts. People like, like sushi was unaudited, like $700 million locked in there. That's so, that, that's nuts, like, in my opinion. And then there's like a pre-mine of this, you know, the sushi was uh, 27 million tokens was just reallocated allocated to master chef who could dump it at any moment, crisis the market, which he did. So, uh, D-Y-O-R, do your own research. That's my best advice. Answer. Next slide. Yeah, so, so this is the example of Pickle. 75% um, of reward, so it didn't say like five times more, but it's out of all the pools, it gives you 75%. And this is the, 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 the return compared to others, right? Who, who doesn't want this return? But for that, you need to buy pickles, so. Um. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so where can you spot the opportunities? A uh, few websites. Uh, the, the screenshot was from CoinGecko. Um, the, you can turn on this DJ and all this, the, the, all this vegetable. Um, swaps, uh, the projects are going to be there, uh, yeah, next slide, all right, let's talk about the risks, it's actually one of the last slides, so we're almost there, liquidation risk, that's uh, when you lend, and like I said, if you, the, the collateral ratio is good enough, uh, you won't get liquidated, but you can if the price drops too fast, like it happened in March, so how you can mitigate it, um, you basically monitor, the, the, the collateral factor, and then you mitigate the risk by restoring the healthy <coughs> collateral factor. In permanent loss, um, the, the risk is that compared to just holding your asset, you're making less in returns when you put it in the pool because this, the other asset pair doesn't appreciate this much in, in value, so your link token didn't go up this much in value in the pool rather than just holding by itself. So mitigation, just hold it and don't put them into liquidity pools okay the smart contract risk uh, this is vulnerabilities um, bad faith um, some actions from developers um, so um, what you can do audit smart contracts that they're, that they're companies that are auditing them again this is not a hundred percent proof that it's uh, all all kosher everything is working again do your own research and then you can use insurance. If uh, something happens, there's a decentralized insurance that something happens with a smart contract, you get, you get paid back the money. And then the last one is the biggest, uh, the most hardcore risk, which has the less, the least uh, risk, I mean, the least uh, um, possibility of happening is, uh, I know, the, the blockchain gets messed up, something happens with the whole blockchain, so consensus fail or whatever. So you can actually hedge your Ethereum price on Deribit exchange. And remember that any of these mitigations, they incur some cost to you. So your, your um, returns um, a little bit diminished because you have extra costs. Okay, uh, we went through the farming, how to be there safely, what we have to look on. Let's get to the next slide. Oh, that's it, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Artur. Yeah, people are going to hear you in school. Uh, what do you think about the governance tokens? Like in the case of uh, you 
in finance, uh, the distribution happened like an airdrop without, without an actual price. He said it's worthless, like, there's no price. But in the Uniswap case, there was a price already. So what do you think in terms of regulations? Like what's going to happen to those government tokens? Are they going to become like obsolete in some, at some point or it's just going to stay like that forever? And That's a good question, right? Um, especially about the IG token, Yearn Finance and then Uniswap. Um, basically, if we to think of in terms of regulation, um, every this DeFi can, may need its um, regulatory body if it's a, if it's a lending borrowing, then you need to have, uh, um, you know, the lending borrowing, um, um, how do you call it, um, uh, so this uh, agreement, uh, I mean, um, lending borrowing, yeah, lending borrowing license, license yeah. If, if it's about insurance, like Nexus Mutual, you need an in insurance, right? So it can go as, as, as far as that. Uh, in terms of this governance tokens, I don't know, look, they, they are not using the word issuing and then, okay, saying, oh, it has no value and so on, but at the same time, it's got listed on exchange, uh, so who knows? But I, I did really like the year in distribution. There's no this, like this one inch when, where 50% points to founders, investors like Binance Labs, right? And then they just dump these tokens and, you know, investor never loses in this case because they got these tokens at super cheap. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I think. Yeah, I just want to add something I think is really um, important about to note about DeFi, and that is that um, any particular project might fail on it, but it, since it's also tied together, um, there's a kind of resiliency to it because as long as part of the stack is sound and there's no smart contract risk, like you say, or no smart contract exploit that will survive even if some part of it uh, falls off. So I don't know if you had any comments on that, but I just see that as, um, that's part of the excitement for me, because you might take individual risks, but the class of uh, opportunities is there to stay. Right, so it's just $8 billion lot compared to the whole financial world, that's nothing. That's why I think it's still a big, big playground with a bunch of whales. Well, we saw there's uh, only 50,000 users in the whole DeFi space, and uh, we can think of it so it is a playground of whales, and, and that's it, to, to test the grounds, risks are always there, it happened. Uh, when this thing is going to collapse again, uh, it's a really good test for all these coding smart contracts, how they're going to be, all this composability will be working against each other. So. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to be developed, and I, I'm glad I'm part of this movement too. Is Bitcoin going to be part of that movement as well, or just going to be there? So, is, is, is Bitcoin going to be the, going to be the part of that mo movement, right? Um, so, Bitcoin has layer two solution, Lightning Network, and there's also smart contracts possibilities. But Bitcoin is meant for payments, and Lightning Network is also meant for payments. All Ethereum is, or whatever, all the smart contract abilities, uh, blockchains are meant for DeFi. <laughs> oh, this, uh, yeah, so somebody, somebody said scam, right? But uh, there's a part truth in that too, because there's a lot of this scam projects, but there's a good stuff too. Because, and why people are building on Ethereum? Because all this uh, ICO craze a few years ago, um, it has already an ecosystem, it has already some apps in it, right? So why, do I have, why the hell do I have to build on Tron or EOS? There's an ecosystem there, there's, there's tools there, so... Uh, there are some cool, really cool projects being built on. Well, I, I use it, right? How do you see Ethereum 2.0 in the future? Uh, 2.0, I think it's scaling, it, it's all scaling solutions. That, that's all I know, that's it. Hey, Binance wants to go into DeFi space. What do you think about that? Well, Justin Sun wants to do that too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who doesn't, right? <laughs> if Binance wants to go, uh, nobody wants to lose, but wants to uh, miss a piece of that action. Like everybody, it's, uh, it's, it's business, right? Like, it's future. And they have the resources, their aggressiveness, their, their culture, uh, they're trying. But again, look, we're thinking of this centralized organization, Binance, against the, the whole community of uh, Ethereum blockchain. 
Uh, same with like Yearn community that is building all these apps compared to centralized apps that are building. I think it's the same um, example. No? No? No one? No one? No one didn't understand it. Okay, I I you do? It's, it's more about something you s were talking in the beginning about uh, someone in Africa taking uh, a loan and paying uh, like interest daily. So f in order for him to take a loan on the DeFi, he has to have money to deposit as a collateral. So how would that w how would that work in your opinion in the future? Because he doesn't have the money right now to go to fish, so he takes the loan to have the money to go fishing. So in order for him to take the money out of uh, the DeFi apps, let's say he would have to have money to deposit as a collateral. So how would that work? That's a great question because this is the connection between uh, the real world assets and then the DeFi space. So exactly. So that's the fiat on ramps and off ramps, and and Paxful is actually doing that. So we as Paxful, we are the fiat on ramp and off ramp for the whole. Bitcoin ecosystem, soon uh, DeFi ecosystem. So once there are easy off-ramps and off-ramps into DeFi and back to your whatever bank account, that's when it's going to work. So the off-ramps and on-ramps need to be built. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. And uh, that's going to be it for today. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. You can still stay here, chat with each other, have some beers and non-alcoholic drinks as well. And yeah, thank you again for uh, Martin Baum and Arthur. And I hope, really, that we're going to see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you.